Hello and good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for tuning in today. My name is Spencer Rukti. I'm the author events manager here at Third Place Books in Lake Forest Park, Washington and Seattle, Washington. I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's conversation between Jess Walter and Katie Sewell, who are with us, literally with us tonight for the paperback release of The Cold Millions. Uh, yes, let's hear some applause, uh, the miracle of applause. Uh, first of all, maybe a bit of an explanation as to why uh, you're seeing a bookstore set up right now and uh, when you're probably expecting to see our faces on Zoom and sort of a Brady Bunch setup. Uh, this event, like several of our fall events, was originally planned back in August uh, to take place live in this room with an audience as well. Uh, vaccination rate was on the rise. Um, the, we were feeling a bit safer with our masks on or taking our masks off in public. Uh, and then, of course, we had the rise of the Delta variant, uh, breakthrough cases, and the disruption of the supply chain, and that sort of made life insane, and we decided it was unwise to bring groups of people into the bookstore. Uh, so for the second time since March of 2020, we decided to cancel all of our in-person events and made them virtual. Uh, but when we learned that Jess was going to be in Seattle anyway on October 15th, uh, likely calling in from his hotel room just a few miles away, um, we had an idea. What if we hosted authors in the store? but without an audience. Though I shouldn't say no audience, we do have a small assortment of our booksellers and their special guests here tonight. Oh, we're gonna take a pause and deal with some technical difficulties. We are working on the technical difficulties, so just bear with us at home there. And we're back live. Uh, I was just about to get to the section where I say, Please bear with us if there are any technical difficulties this evening. Um, this is an unusual setup for us. It's our first time uh, trying a live stream in this format. Hopefully not the last time. Um, as we do more of these, we'll get better and better. And that's the beauty of it. Uh, with that said, if you have ever attended a virtual book event, you're probably familiar with the feeling of watching an author you love call in from a poorly lit living room or kitchen. Uh, and you get to participate in the Zoom chat and talk to strangers you've never, uh, you know, you have no idea who these people are. Um, and you're not sure if the author can read what you're writing in the Zoom chat. And it's a very liminal experience. And at the end of this hour, you shut your laptop and the silence that follows is really eerie. And I've had, and I've done dozens and dozens of these now. And many bookstore, you know, events managers have had to do the same. Uh, many people who are doing arts programming have had to do the same. And uh, virtual events has given the, us the opportunity to host so many authors that we normally wouldn't uh, be able to. But if you're anything like me, what's obviously missing from that experience is being able to turn to the person next to you and ask them about it or, or meet the author and uh, shake their hands and say hello. Um, you get a mingle. I mean, it's that silence really after a virtual event, sort of scary, it kind of it reminds you of, you know, what we're missing here. So uh, this is all to say, of course, this is not just true for book events. This is true for arts events of all kinds. The reason we wanted to go through this song and dance of putting this together is really to remind you that bookstore events are coming back. Uh, not today, not maybe soon, but they will. And we're very excited to have you back in the store one day. Uh, so please, for the love of God, um, keep buying books, buy them early before the holidays, and uh, also keep saying nice things about our booksellers on Twitter. That really, that really helps us. Uh, all right, so now some brief Zoom housekeeping. Uh, you all have probably already found the Zoom chat function. Um, alongside the chat function, there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your window. Uh, we would love to hear your questions tonight, so please submit your questions to that window, 
uh, we will be writing them old school on index cards and handing them to Katie for the last 15 minutes uh, of this event. Um, we will sort those questions out, pass them along. Uh, oh, we also offer closed captioning for those who are interested. You just have to uh, click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen to turn those on and off. And now let's introduce our speakers. Jess Walter is the author of nine books, among them The Cold Millions, Beautiful Ruins, The Financial Lives of the Poets, and the National Book Award finalist The Zero, the New York Times notable book Over Tumbled Graves, the story collection We Live in Water, and Citizen Vince, which was a winner of the Edgar Award. The Cold Millions is the winner of the Washington State Book Award and the Langham Prize in American Historical Fiction. Katie Sewell is a radio producer and host, as well as a journalist and a podcast consultant. She has worked at KDU, KUOW Public Radio since 2003 and has also worked with Radio Lab and a Prairie Home Companion. She's the creator and editor of the Bittersweet Life podcast, which she's been co-hosting with Tiffany Parks since 2014. She's probably also the only sound engineer in the room right now. The reason for tonight's event is the paperback release of The Cold Millions, which, despite its pandemic hardcover release in October of 2020, still went on to be a national bestseller and a best book of the year, the New York Times Book Review, NPR's Fresh Air, and the Seattle Times, and more. NPR actually called this book a literary miracle. Anthony Doerr calls it a literary unicorn, which I think is an even better way of putting it. And, it goes, and uh, Tony Doerr goes on to write that Jess is a national treasure. Now, one last endorsement. Um, there is a wonderful bookstore in Jess's hometown of Spokane, Washington, uh, called Auntie's Bookstore. And the events coordinator over there and I developed sort of a lengthy correspondence over the summer um, when both of us were trying to decide what we were going to be doing about our fall event series. And at some point, we started writing about Jess, I remember, and Claire wrote to me, and this is verbatim from her email, I feel like every person who came up to the register to buy a copy of The Cold Millions last fall was his neighbor, friend, or bartender. Uh, <laughs> hell, he and my dad play pickup basketball together. Every single time I talk to Jess, it makes me want to be kinder and more generous and more thoughtful. And I have to say, authors like that are really few and far between. So everyone, please join me in welcoming Jess Walter and Katie Sewell. Be here. <laughs> I'll, well, I'll fill the space while you get your microphone. Thank you so much, Spencer. Um, uh, and thank you all for coming. Thank you, Katie, for doing this. And, uh, and it's so great to be back at Third Place Books, one of my favorite named bookstores ever. Um, and for those of you who haven't been here, this wall for book lovers is incredible. First edition signed books. Um, uh, every time I would come here on book tour, I would end up spending far more than I made in whatever copies I sold. And already I've already picked one out. So, um, uh, but thank you all for coming. Um, uh, because of the pandemic and uh, uh, Spencer covered those uh, existential uh, Zoom issues really well, I tried to look for a way to do something different with book tour. Usually I go around to cities and bookstores and uh, and talk to people and this time i thought maybe i could bring spokane washington which is the setting of the cold millions to people and maybe i could bring um to these zoom book of events uh a little bit of the book itself so um i made a sort of ken burnsian style uh, video with a filmmaker friend of mine and i think we're going to show that now um, and then Katie and I will uh, come back in a few minutes and uh, have a lively discussion about it. I've always admired authors who create a fictional version of their real homes. The Albany of William Kennedy, Elena Ferrante's Naples, the Monterey Peninsula of John Steinbeck. Over the course of nine books, I've ventured far away to New York and the Zero, Italy and Hollywood and beautiful ruins, but I always find myself coming back to Spokane. They woke on a ball field, bums, tramps, hobos, stiffs, 
They floated in from mines and farms and log camps, filled every flop and boarding house, slept in parks and alleys, and on the night just past, this abandoned ball field. My new novel, The Cold Millions, begins here, Peaceful Valley, Spokane, Washington, 1909. The book mixes fiction and history in a way that's almost impressionistic, blending past events with present concerns. My first inspirations were these old postcards that I collect of my home. Town from the early 1900s. Living in Spokane can feel like living among ghosts. Every day you walk in the turn of the 20th century. Streets, the ground under your feet. This was a period I'd wanted to write about for years, the end of the last Gilded Age, when Spokane was only a few decades old, lurching from wild frontier town to modern city, doubling in size every six or seven years to nearly the place it is now. The buildings that now house thriving coffee shops and brew pubs once a mix of brothels and bars, banks and boarding houses, vaudeville theaters and flop houses for miners and farmers. Brutal cops and private detectives skulk downtown with rifles peeking out beneath their trench coats and thousands of itinerant workers, hobos, came by train from all over looking for work. This is the postcard that first sparked my imagination. As a writer, you stare at something like this and you can't help but wonder about the details, the things that live behind the official history, the packed streetcars, the casinos, a woman in white moving across the frame, a man walking down a side street. This is where the novelist steps in to ask, what are they all doing down there? The story I set out to tell was based on real events. The free speech riots of 1909 in Spokane and the Wobblies, the industrial workers of the world, the first union to take women, freed slaves, Native Americans, anyone with a job could be a Wobbly. It's a story of social unrest, of police brutality, of deep inequality, of the ache of wanting a better world, issues that resonate today. The IWW was outlawed from speaking and organizing on the streets. In Spokane, Wobblies staged the first successful nonviolent protests in US history, a model for civil rights leaders and other peaceful activists. Speeches dissolved into riots, police and private goons beat protesters. There were mass arrests, 500 people locked up, the jails so full they threw prisoners in an old high school. The Cold Millions is the story of Gig and Ride Dolan, adventuring vagrant brothers who get swept up in this turbulent class warfare. It's also the story of two women they meet, Ursula the Great, who sings on a vaudeville stage with a live cougar, and the labor activist and suffragist Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, a courageous, pregnant 19-year-old who comes to Spokane to lead the fight for justice. My research involved books, academic papers, letters, hundreds of newspapers. But in Spokane, you can walk right through history, like walking through a neighborhood filled with the mansions of mining magnates. Or a simple clabbered house where Spokane's police chief was shot to death through the window by an assassin. The ghosts are everywhere. Even though it's fiction, I began to think of this novel as a loose origin story for my hometown, connecting the place we are now to the place we were then. But it's also a kind of origin story for my own working class family. Both of my grandfathers were itinerant workers in the West who found their way to Eastern Washington a generation later. My dad was a steel worker and union leader for 40 years. It's the truth of both history and historical fiction, I think, that the deeper you look into the past, the more you find yourself encountering the present moment. I know that was the case with the cold millions. These themes, the nature of progress, our endless struggle for social equality, 
They churn at the heart of this novel the way the Spokane River cuts through my western city, unceasing and inevitable, carving a path through time and stone to the ocean. Thank you for visiting my town. I hope you enjoy the cold millions. Okay. Wow. <laughs> well, you certainly raised the bar on everyone's book tour going forward that they have to hire Ken Burns or somebody like him to make a video about your book. That's pretty imp important and amazing. Um, so to get us started, I wanted to talk a little bit about the structure of the book. I know some of the you here in the room haven't read it yet. Um, and online, we've now been introduced to the characters, but what's the structure of this book? Yeah, the... Um... It, the main motif of the book and of the city is that river. And I really use the river as kind of an organizing principle. So the third person story is of these two brothers, Gig and Rye Dolan, who are itinerant workers, hobos, as they would have called themselves then, meaning they wandered and worked. Um, and you follow them as they get swept up in the free speech uh, protests of 1909 and the labor movement. Um, but then I bring in all these other characters. I really wanted the novel to feel teeming like those postcards, just people everywhere. And so there are these first person stories that come in. Ursula the Great, who is um, a vaudeville singer who dances and sings with a live cougar. Um, Jules, a Spokane Indian and Native American who is also swept up in these labor battles. Um, uh, and of course, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, the, the labor activist who in many ways is kind of the hero of the novel. Um, police officers, Pinkerton agents, assassins. You get all these little first person stories that connect um, the way undercurrents or tributaries do to a river um, and connect with Gig and Rye's third person story. So uh, my father who read this book with his book group was very impressed and I don't think this spoils anything for those of you who haven't read it. It was very impressed that the narrator of the first chapter is killed in his narration. Uh, so the very first person we meet does not stick with us past the first chapter of the book. Why did you do that? <laughs> um, uh, th th well, thank your dad's book club for me first. <laughs> um, you know, the, uh, as, as I was writing the novel, a novel set in 1909, many of these real characters, I had the sense that I was sort of writing about ghosts. These people were gone. And it felt kind of intimate to write them through their last moments. And when I was organizing the chapters, um, a police officer was shot and killed in Spokane about four days before the free speech protests. And it made really hardened the police and their reaction um, to the industrial workers of the world, the union that organize these things. And, uh, and I kept thinking, I wanted this character's um, small place in the story to be so unforgettable. Um, and so, you know, it, 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 it also, I also thought as an author, boy, I'm not messing around, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. like if you, if you follow a character and that, and you get to see that character breathe their last breath and confront their own mortality. Um, it, for me as an author, it, it gave me a kind of responsibility for these characters. I, I, it's hard to explain, but I just felt this intimacy with them. Um, and then there were, you know, it was a way to sort of show uh, violence, you know, in a way that I think left me sort of breathless at different times. So I, I always just hope the reader experiences the same thing I'm sort of experiencing as I write it. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of the larger question I wanted to ask is death plays such a prominent role in this book. I mean, it's also about... Uh, labor activism and social change, but it is about death. And why was death such a central 
character motif tributary whatever you yeah like. um there's a there's a metaphor that this character Jules uses in the book um about he witnesses a young man going over the Spokane Falls and Spokane Falls is the of course most dramatic thing in the city and so he thinks of death as going over um and this idea that we all no matter how our life is we all go over alone and uh and i felt like that idea did sort of haunt the book again i i, I guess because i was writing about a period 1909 that has slipped away in history we don't we don't really talk about labor history we certainly don't talk about the free speech um, protests and arrests of 1909 through 1916 this period that happened it's just one of those historical moments that has that we've allowed to drift and fade away those those people who live those lives many of the characters in the book are real figures and um and so i that that idea that that you know that temporal nature that 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 these characters were here and now they're gone to me just really animated the story and um and it is a life or death story for for the characters and so it, it was a way to both up the stakes but also you know to really consider what it means to be alive what it means to throw yourself into a cause the way so many of these people do this might be a this might be an impossible question to answer but I mean, I think it's a question we've asked during the pandemic, too, is why did we never talk about the 1918 flu until now? It's almost like we we would jump from World War I to World War II. It's like we just blazed over the history, that part of the history. Did you get a sense of why certain things like this disappear? Yeah, I mean, it, it, unless you're a history major in college, you, I think most of us have that sense. We Our history was taught like this timeline in which you know, the Civil War occurs, then maybe the Spanish-American War, and then all of a sudden it's World War I, you know, and then the next thing we talk about is the Great Depression. And it's almost as if those, these other things that don't fit into the arc of this narrative kind of fall away. And I think labor history is one of those things that sort of fell away, in part because many of the people like Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, who's um, who's featured in the novel became communists. They, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, uh, helped start the ACLU and later was the the chair, the president of Communist Party USA. Many of those people had to either choose between their beliefs and the things that they acted on, or or be imprisoned as she was. Um, I've heard, I've gotten so many letters and emails from people whose grandparents were in the industrial workers of the world who were in the early labor movement um and and so many of them their their families stopped talking about it and hid it so i think specifically with this um you know it, it was that you know and, and obviously you know the way communism was practiced in the soviet union in maoist china there's there's no um you know there there's you know that that is such a dark period of history that i think sometimes some of these early labor activists and socialists were sort of lost in that it's interesting though my kids don't have that that historical pr perspective um, i think all three of my kids would call themselves socialists at some level and so to bring back a character like elizabeth Gurley flynn who was not talking about the sort of communism practiced in the Soviet Union. She was just talking about raising everyone up, giving everyone a fair chance, fighting for women's rights, for the rights of people of color, very modern ideas that I think this early labor movement really embodied and that I felt like needed to be brought back. It's really interesting. So I'm not sure this mic is still on. Is it? Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we talk a lot about uh, a reader's perception being changed by reading a book that we can get an insight into a different period or a different time but what happens to the author uh -huh. did you change did it change your perception of the world by writing this book yeah it always does um you know i think as the author you go on the same journey as the reader except at a much slower deeper pace and so yeah i i started out knowing i wanted to write about this period of my hometown spokane washington when it was one of the most thriving cities in the West, um, second only to San Francisco in its, um, uh, as a, as a show town. Um, 
full of incredible wealth and and then the the center of one of the of one of these uh, a real landmark in progressive labor history. And so I knew I wanted to write about that period. Um, that, but there were so many surprises along the way, various echoes of the world we live in now, certainly. Um, uh, but also uh, the realization that I was writing a class novel at its deepest root. Um, you know, and the, and the way those characters grow on you, you don't really know the characters when you start out, you start on this journey with them and you're locked in a car with them and you find out these wonderful things like Rye, this hobo is a clothes horse, you know, he loves nice gloves and ties and, um, and the fact and finding those things out just opens up the humanity of these characters. So you have this, these two things that happen where you're researching and learning about this historical period, you're applying it to the world you're in now. So the issues of income inequality, of women's rights, of um, civil disobedience and police brutality are, are sort of dovetailing with the world you're in, but then you're also getting to know these people. And so by the end, it's, um, it's, it's, it's like alchemy, what's happened. You know, the, the novel reflects the world you live in, the world they lived in, um, and you have such a strong feeling for those people. Well, that's another question I had, is how emotionally entwined with these people are you by the time it comes to an end? Are they, people I, sometimes talk about their characters as being their friends, you know, yeah. or being sad that their time is coming to an end. How do you feel? Yeah, um... Okay. Um, yeah, the, the question was how I feel about the characters if I they become friends or I become so close to them. I do get such an attachment to them. And, um, you know, I remember writing Beautiful Ruins and I saved the very last image of Pasquale and Dee until I had the novel exactly right. I did not want to say goodbye to them um until i had really written rewritten the novel to a place where i loved it and so i knew what i wanted to have happen at the end the last vision i wanted them but i did not want to write it um i didn't i i wanted to write an ending that i felt was worthy of these characters that i had you know i that i'd come to know so well and i yeah i choked up when i wrote it the last time it was like you know, I've, I've lived with you people for 15 years and, you know, I'm sorry I wasn't a better writer that I couldn't couldn't make this work. The, a similar thing happened with Rye. Um, I don't want to give away the ending of the novel, but in the, the novel moves around uh, and the last glimpse of Rye we have is 1964 when he's working at Kaiser Aluminum, which is the year my dad started working at Kaiser Aluminum. And so that sort of connection between this character and my father and my grandfather um, he was really emotional. You know, I, all of a sudden these characters I'd imagined uh, existed in a world that I knew because of of these men who these working class men who also helped inspire the novel and so that that connection um yeah it makes it it, it really does you know I, I felt such such sort of uh tenderness toward rye in his last moments that yeah it's a little embarrassing because he's just made up of letters formed into words formed into sentences but i swear i could see him on the street if i if i had to that's what I was going to ask, since you live in Spokane, Washington, and um, quite a few of your books are set in Spokane, as the, the whole city is now littered with people you've invented. Yeah, is the city of Spokane littered with people <laughs> I've invented? Um, it's littered with people who beat me at basketball, as, uh, <laughs> as uh, the bookseller at Antis uh, um, uh, can attest. Um, yeah, it, it's funny that there are some people who take sort of mini tours of of various places in my books and they always want to know where's the book where's the donut shop in citizen vince and um you know and and with this book there there is an entire tour you could take of 1909 spokane because most of the city that existed in that period um exists as it does now i always liken it to a Victorian house where the owners didn't have money to renovate it in the 70s and 80s. So the pocket doors are still there. They've not put any shag carpet over the wood floors. All of Spokane is like a Victorian house um, that wasn't remodeled in the 70s and 80s. And so you can still see that 
you know, beautiful original turn of the century architecture um, uh, of this thriving labor town everywhere. Wow. Well, it's so interesting too, because the hardcover version of this book came out oh, a year ago, I guess almost exactly. This, okay, Closer sorry. to my mouth, yeah. just working. Hello, yeah. hello, testing, testing. Yeah. Um, so the the hardcover came out almost a year ago. Now you're on tour for the paperback version. A year is a lot of distance, and it's a lot of talking about yeah. in a way where I say, oh, I have 30 minutes, you know, tell me about this book, when the book is actually quite large. But what is it like for you talking about this book so many times over the last year? What happens? Yeah, uh, I mean, it happens almost the minute you, minute you finish it because you have to tell people what it's about. And that process is so reductive. I used to say it's about 100,000 words. Um, <laughs> uh, but it, but it's kind of reductive to say it's a labor novel. It's, a, it's because it really is, you know, I talk about the issues in the book, but it's really kind of a rip roaring yarn. I wanted to write a Western that my dad would love. And I wanted to people it with um with treacherous pinkerton agents and and so in describing it you always do feel like you reduce it to this small thing and um i always have to go back and kind of read it to to inflate it again to fill it back with air and and yeah. with the lives of the of the people inside it um i think having done a zoom tour was sort of strange too because uh you know, you know, when you've read a book and you can't wait to share it with people, you're like, oh my gosh, you have to read Less by Andrew Sean Greer. It's so funny. And you just want to hand that book off to people. Well, when you've written a book, you really want to do that. And, <laughs> um, and, and you can do that over Zoom and you do it through emails. And I've had great reception for this novel. It's been, it's been one of my favorite things is having people remark about it and write about it. Um, but to be in the room and, you know, and have people say, you know, how did you think of, you know, how Ursula could survive in the, uh, in a, in a cage with a live cougar, you know, how did you know she would so meet into her corset and then throw the corset to the cougar, you know, mm -hmm. that, um, just that sort of visceral thing of that basic thing of sharing what the story's about and some of your favorite things. I really do feel like I've missed. Um, but then, you, then you're then you sort of proud of the book as this thing unto itself to, you know, people's reactions to it. It's gotten great reviews and a couple of nice awards. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, so there, there's, there's, that, there's that real sense of that you accomplish something. And, and then my favorite part is just sliding it on the shelf. You know, yes, and um, going on to the next thing. I and going on to the next thing, yeah, yeah. But in, in that reductiveness, like you yourself have to, I don't know, did you write the jacket copy as well? Or is that somebody else who, uh, who someone figures else, out how to describe someone it? Someone always writes it and then the author kind of takes another shot at it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that, that process, like from the very beginning is sort of reductive, you know, and then, and anyone who's read my books know that I kind of write all over the place. Like, mm -hmm. um, I don't like to be contained by genre. And, um, and so we've, and that's the first place where it's sort of reductive. You know, someone says this goes in fiction. Someone says this goes in mystery. And, um, and so the, that whole process shrinks it to a place, but then when people read it again, you just hope that it blows up as it felt to you like the whole world. Hmm. Well, and the other interesting thing I think about it is, you know, but when you p write that final sentence and you send it off, other people start getting involved. You have an editor now, uh, you have an artist who's coming up with what this cover is going to look like, or a bunch of artists competing for your cover. Not sure how that works either, but and it kind of just starts this spillover that's going to happen as it enters the world. It's going to spill into book groups. Artists are going to react to it in whatever ways. What's that like, this sort of beginning of watching it get outside the margins? You know, it's... Um... <sighs> I, I, it's happened so it's happened to me now i guess nine times so i've gotten sort of used to it but there is always this jarring moment i i remember when the um when they sent me covers and we were talking about the the sort of power of that image of the falls and so they sent me some waterfall images for covers and they all looked like those waterfalls in hawaii you know like those uh, really far trickling Romantic, waterfalls. Yeah, yeah right and yeah. uh 
And I'm like, that's not what our, what the waterfalls look like. It looks like it's this wide churning, powerful, you know, burst of river. And so mm. there's this moment when you realize not everyone sees exactly what you think you've created. Um, and you know, that, mm. And, and it's a great lesson, actually. I mean, it's one, one thing I love about books. If we go to a movie, we all see the same movie. We may have a different reaction to it. But every person who reads a book is sh showing a different movie in their head. Uh, it's amazing to me how many people want to cast the books for me. I have the perfect cast, you know, and uh, um, because they've, they've, they've seen the movie in their head. And, um, and you just hope you've given them the material to make a great movie, you know, and that that's the same as with editors and artists and everyone along the way. And anyone who works in publishing knows that they're the best people. They're, they're readers. They, they want to help you bring this thing, um, you know, to, to its, you know, to its best conclusion. I remember, you know, the, the artist had, had so liked this idea of these undercurrent chapters that, um, that they proposed this sort of swirling um, image at the beginning of all those first person chapters. Mm. And I loved that, 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 that small addition, I think really made so much sense to me with the book. Hmm. Well, then I, I know you've told me that you have people that are thinking about it, making it into a TV show. You have people who want to make it into an opera. You have people who want to make it into all sorts of ways. And, and in some ways that's like you create it and then you watch it fly off in its own directions. Is, is that something you enjoy or? Um, I've been involved. So a, a handful of the books have, um, in fact, most of my novels have gotten optioned and had some talk of making them into a film. And it's disconcerting because they will make composite characters and cut things and change things. You have to sort of uh, allow that these are different forms. Um, I think I'm the most excited about uh, the cold millions, the opera, um, just because, uh, you know, um, working class kid from Spokane, Washington, um, doesn't, doesn't dream often of having an opera made, but there's a composer and librettist who, um, who are trying really hard to make this into an opera that will premiere at the Met in New York. And, uh, how amazing would that be to have, uh, so yeah, it's, it's flattering and exciting, but I, I think as an author, you have to allow that, um, that the thing they make is going to be an entirely different creature than the thing you made mm -hmm. that, that that this will be the root for it um you know and and there's a part of me though that if if no movies get made from my novels i will not mind being the last word you know i will not mind my last vision of of d and pasquale and beautiful ruins being the enduring one um mm -hmm. uh so i i feel sometimes like i can't lose you know yeah so i just want to make a shout out for people who are watching at home that we're going to be taking some questions pretty soon. So if you have them, please get them in. And for those of you who are here, if you have one, you can walk up here as soon as like, just let me know <laughs> that, that you have one. Um, and I'll hold this microphone to your face. Uh, can I ask you a, like a very, very general question? Sure. Why do you write? <laughs> Why do I write? Um, wow. That is it. That's not a general question. That's the most profound question. Um, I write for so many different way, reasons, but I think the two primary ones are that that's the way I experience life. It's the smartest, most sensitive, most interesting version of myself on the page. Um, I write in a journal. I have written journalism. I write every single day and it's, it's I don't even feel like I can process my emotions or the world around me without doing that now. Um, but the second part is it's play for me. Um, uh, it's my favorite thing to do. The, uh, I love the way musicians talk about music. They never say they're going to work. They say they're going to play. Um, if they, if you never see a musician grab a guitar and go, Oh, I've got to work. I've got to work on this thing. You know, they just want to play. They want to sit at the piano and compose. And I love doing that. I love playing with words and images and stories. Um, so those two things, you know, processing the world that way. And then I suppose at some point, someone in school told me I was pretty good at it. And so the reward you get from thinking that you're, 
that that you have some ability in something uh, is probably the third part of that. Yeah, but it is interesting because you do more so than you hear from musicians and and other art forms. You do hear writers complain more writers, more writers than almost any about how hard the drudgery writers are of it. such babies no it, uh, <laughs> and no. it i mean it is hard but so i mean why do you think that would be like if it's so playful for you like, it's so hard to do well but i would argue the same about music too i mean um you know there you can sit around a campfire and uh and play a song and it doesn't mean it's going to be great and especially when you're composing something new something that hasn't been done before um it is it's very hard i don't mean to minimize it at all uh the thing that often freezes people though i think is not writing but not writing it's um, the not not writing right or it's, no it's the not writing it's the yeah, not writing it's it the off. freeze <laughs> yeah yeah hold that thought yes oh, wow. i can keep answering though because it's still yeah uh, i'll keep answering even though our faces may have disappeared for a moment um yeah that i think it's i think what's really paralyzing are those moments when you don't know what to say when the screen is blank when you can't when you can't get it to work um when you finish it and it's not quite right i think that happens all the time it certainly happens to me mm -hmm. um it it doesn't make those periods any easier um but by thinking of writing as play by thinking of it as um you know as something that i do that is is like creating music i feel like um it i feel like it it makes it easier for me to do it too. I mean, part of it, I think, is just to convince myself that it's not hard. Um, but I get stuck and frozen. Beautiful Runs took me 15 years because I couldn't get the story right. I had to set it down and pick other things up. But but I think that's the other key for me is if I'm stuck on one thing, I can always be writing something else. Well, I'll do one more and then I'll start asking these questions. Um, just since we're all readers in the room, not everybody watching or here necessarily as a writer also. Um, I know you get a lot of reviews of your books. What what should we as readers make of reviews that we read? Like when we're searching for something to find something that might, you know, catch our attention. Wow. How much weight should we be putting on what, say, the New York Times says about something? I mean, I, I'm sort of old school. Um, I can remember the first... I remember when I wrote Citizen Vince, which was a crime novel, and I thought, I'm going to write a crime novel that feels like f scott fitzgerald it's going to really be about class and i wrote this novel and you know and it, it was well received and and partly as a crime novel but then i remember um my wife calling and saying you might want to pull over and then she read me the washington post review by maureen corrigan which said um which compared the book to the great gatsby and said you know uh, fitzgerald conjured a pretty good a story about class and the great gatsby but um uh, but walter you know creates a a, a a a not a better one but anyway it was uh it it was so rewarding to have a professional book critic someone whose job that is um not just say the you know uh, work of transcendent genius or whatever those blurbs are but to really connect with the intent of the book um i love i love all reviews i love you know audible reviews i even love the people who you know will get on and uh amazon and say this wasn't my cup of tea um i wanted to read something funny and this was not funny you know and, mm -hmm. which is sort of like saying i wanted a truck and i and i got this car you know so <laughs> i wanted veal piccata and this looks like a taco you know and um <laughs> but but i just love that process it it is such a give and take and it really is you know again to compare it to movies you watch a movie you've invested two hours if someone reads a book of mine they've invested um a week perhaps you know hours and hours they've cast and run the movie in their head they've processed all those sentences and you know hopefully pulled out some of the lyricism so of course i want to hear what they want to say and i really want to hear what um what a professional book critic says that that criticism is a kind of lost art and we should all be reading the new york review of books and and the reviews in newspaper sections when i started every newspaper had a book review section now there are really just a handful 
And I think we've made up for that in customer reviews and bookstore reviews and other kinds of reviews. Um, but those that the people who are professional critics, I think, just do an invaluable job. Uh, and, and, and what I would say to read for is not just that praise that goes in a blurb on the book, um, but the deeper meaning of what the author intended and whether or not they might have gotten there. Hmm. All right, so we're going to turn to a few questions to, right. from the audience to wrap things up. Uh, Lillian asks, I saw Dashiell Hammett on your bookshelf at home. So yeah, good watching. Yeah. You are obviously a, and you are obviously a big fan of Tolstoy. What other classic novelists have had an impact on your writing? Oh, my gosh. I mean, you touched on F. Scott's bit Cheryl yeah. there, but um, uh, I'll say a quick thing about Dashiell Hammett, he lived in Spokane um, when he was working on uh, Red Harvest. He was a Pinkerton agent. Um, he was involved in the very kinds of actions that are in this book. In fact, um, he used to tell the story that he was offered, I think it was $4,000 to kill Frank Little, a union leader who was murdered and dragged behind a car um, in Butte, Montana, uh, and who appears briefly in The Cold Million. So um, Hammett, ties directly into this period of Spokane um, and to the Pinkerton agents. And um, what other authors? Wow. Um, there are so many. I used to, uh, you know, the and, and often I make homages to them in the book. So, of course, Tolstoy, um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude, uh, the novel tracks over 100 years in the book um, that there, you know, there's um, mention of uh, of um, uh, Jack London in the novel. Um, often the, the work that I love kind of bubbles its way up in the surface. This book, though, is also an homage to the social novelists like John Dos Passos and um, John Steinbeck and um, uh, and, and also a novelist like E.L. Doctorow, whose uh, ragtime to me was a sort of model for how to write a big teeming novel. Um, those, those kinds of writers, I think, just work their way up, uh, you know, in so much of, of what it is that I try to do. All right. Jen asks, did writing this book change your relationship with your hometown? Do you know it better or have you infused it with real life? You know, I about as I said in the video about every other book turns out to be about Spokane, um, and which is sort of my relationship to it. I love going away and I love coming home. I love going to Italy and then I love coming back. And each time I write about it, it does change my my sense of it. Doing all that research and finding a city that was so um, thriving and you know uh, almost. Seattle size, basically Portland size at that time, Nashville size. Spokane was this huge thriving city doubling in size every six or seven years. And, um, and that's not the city that I lived in, but it was like being an archaeologist in a living place. I could just walk around and still see all of those places. And I, for, there was a time I felt like I was I was living in a ghost town. I was just walking around and just seeing, well, this was there and that was here and here are the streetcar tracks and, you know, and, and you can do the same in, Se in Seattle, of course. I was walking on Queen Anne and, you know, see the, the, the ghosts of streetcar tracks and, um, and, and cobblestone streets. And um, I, I, yeah, I, th I think I knew, I learned so much about the city's history um, and, and the great thing has been watching people there who didn't know about it you know, sort of learn that same history. Um, I, I, but I think every book sort of teaches me about the place as I, as I write it, you know. I, uh, every once in a while, someone will say, can't you write about the South Hill and some of the wealthier places in town? Why do you always have to choose just the uh, poverty to write about? But I think like, that, that's where I, that's the, the stories that I love to tell the most. Yeah. All right, Don asks, how did you create the despicable character Del Delvo? We haven't talked about it. I mean, I'm guessing it's a composite sketch of e all the evil people you know. <laughs> uh, I don't know anyone like Del Delvo, thankfully. Um, Del Delvo is a, uh, is a Pinkerton. And having done all this research into Pinkertons, I saw that so many of them were British or um, from the UK. And so it was, I, I wanted a character who spoke in the sort of 19th century 
um, British detective lingo. So I read a whole bunch of those books and I, and I really came to him through language. Um, I knew that I didn't know exactly how despicable he would be, but I knew he, his first words in the book are Spokane gave me the morbs and this, I, this word morbs, which in the 19th century meant a feeling of great unease, um, that almost defined Dell. Dell gave me the morbs. Uh, and I just wanted to write a character who would put a chill into everyone when he came in the room that even Lem Brand, who is um, somewhat despicable himself, would be sort of no match for, for the depth of this character. And then his language just continued to, um, you know, to animate who the character was that, you know, when, when something stopped him, he was lobcocked. And um, when someone did something against him, they'd fatty banged him and all these great 19th century arcane bits of language that like this whole story had slipped away. Um, it was so fun bringing those back. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think I know anyone as awful as Dell. <laughs> All right. Uh, I hesitate to ask this, but Mark asks, I grew up in Spokane and we're reading your book in our athletic club, basketball book club. Would you consider accepting either an invitation for a pickup game and or as a revered guest at one of our book club meetings? Either way, we will take care of you. Um, <laughs> if by take care, taking care of me, you mean running me to the hospital after the basketball game, um, <laughs> yeah. I am in, yes, I will, I will come to the basketball game. I've, uh, invented this no contact basketball game, which started as a way of not getting COVID, but has turned into, um, for an aging 56 year old athlete about the only way I can play basketball. So yeah, I'm in, I will, I will bring my, um my a minus game to wherever they are yes yeah. so you can teach them your new yeah. your new game i will and i'll even talk about the book after um if they let me win so. okay <laughs> only yeah only yeah okay an anonymous viewer asks was there a trail of books that led you to writing this one yes there's oh that's a great question there's always a trail of books that leads you to writing it um you know uh I talked about Steinbeck and his books, Cannery Row and Sweet Thursday, the way he, he with such humanity, handles the bums who are outside Doc's place is echoing in the back of my head. Um, I, I was on an Alice Monroe kick and the way she just deals with history and, um, and can span 40 years, the way her characters are always getting on trains was in the back of my head. Um, as I talked about uh, Ragtime by E.L. Doctorow was kicking around in there. Um, I read a lot of proletariat novels, um, those, those novels that you know, sort of pushed socialism in the early part of the century. And most of them were so boring <laughs> because of the, all the speeches in them. And so that's kicking around some other way. Um, and then because I wanted this to be a sort of late period Western, a book like True Grit is uh, kicking around in my head. Um, or uh, um, Little Big Man, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about those anti-Westerns and how to incorporate those. Um, and then some some nonfiction too. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn's autobiography, The Rebel Girl, um, just such a powerful book and the fact that it isn't more well known. Um, so yeah, there was a huge trail of books and that trail really led through War and Peace too, through Tolstoy. And, you know, this big story of, of how lives become part of history. When history rolls in like a big snowball and you are picked up and you roll with history for a while. Mm. And that's, that was what I wanted to have happen to my characters. They're living their small lives and the big snowball of history rolls over and picks them up for a couple of laps and then drops them off. Hmm. Wow. Uh, does anyone here want to ask anything before I ask this last question from online? No? Are you working on anything else? Am I working on anything else? That's three times I've heard that question. Uh, yes. And actually, yeah. Lillian asks, what is your next project? Oh, wow. Lillian's a mind reader. That was like the old Johnny Carson trick. Where, uh, <laughs> right. Karnak. Um, uh, I just finished a book of short stories. I love short stories. They're, um, uh, I love the form and I love reading them. Uh, so it's called The Angel of Rome, and it'll be out in um, next summer. That first story is was kind of a, uh, I wanted to, 
I wanted to go back to Italy and write about Italy again. So I worked with Eduardo Ballerini, the terrific narrator who um, did the audio book. And we sort of collaborated on this idea. And then I wrote the story, The Angel of Rome. Uh, and then there are uh, half a dozen other or a dozen other stories in there. And uh, so that'll be out next year. Um, and, and and then I'm work. I'm just penciling in and starting to write the next novel, which is I don't. Uh, I've never done this before, and I probably won't actually be the title. But I um, I'm in a men's Shakespeare club. We read all the Shakespeare plays, and we had just read uh, The Merchant of Venice. And I sometimes hear spoonerisms in my head, and I heard The Virgin of Menace, which I thought would be the best noir title ever. So. Um, I've never done this, but I I have like a file that says the Virgin of Menace, and then I have all these words after it. So it probably won't actually be called that, but um, but it, yeah, I, I some uh, like a a novel that is uh, sort of noirish and sexy enough to fill that title is what I'm hoping to do next. Whether or not that is the title, That's yeah, great. whether it is. Well, Jess, yeah. thank you so much for coming out tonight and yeah. seeing us in Seattle, thank dark, you. cold, wet. Yeah, damp thank you, Seattle. And, and please, um, you need to find Katie's terrific podcast, The Bittersweet Life. So, oh, um, thank you. I often I like to have a the book of the person <laughs> I'm talking to, and I can't have a podcast yeah, here, it's, but it's an it's a it's an amazing podcast about uh, life and travel and all those big questions, like the big questions you asked me today. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody at home. Well, thank you for all, thank you all of, uh, you know, all six of you for coming tonight. Uh, thank you to Jess. Thank you to Katie. Of course, the book is The Cold Millions out in paperback now. It's a wonderful novel. Um, please, all of our copies now are signed, so please consider going online or stopping by the store um, and picking up your copy. Uh, other than that, uh, have a great night, everyone, and please be well. Thank you.